the first thing I heard this morning was, oh, this seems to be a serious talk. <laughs> I love to show this here in the US because there are still people who doubt global warming, and I said it yesterday, that 99% of all scientists working in this field are absolutely convinced that we're going to have something like global warming. The question is, what's going to happen? That's a little unclear. And when I showed this in Italy, the first question was, how does 2020 look like? <laughs> I actually haven't thought about this. So, <clears throat> Given all these carbon discussions we have, there is a demand that buildings have to reduce their carbon emissions quite significantly. Like in the Western world, about 40-50% of the carbon emissions go back to the operation of buildings. And therefore, in the, Euro the European Union has established a roadmap, 2050 they call it, where the entire building stock has to reduce their carbon emissions by 2050 by 90% which means like basically zero. So that's the roadmap 2050 established by the European Union, and it has to become uh, national legislation. And to be honest, like for an engineer working in this field for now almost 20 years, we have no idea how this could be ac accomplished. So I think we have to be very innovative, we have to be creative in order to get even close to this goal. So, but then at the same time, I think it's very important that as designers we think about uh, environmental and architectural quality at the same time. I like to show this spa, which is in Tokyo, where we found this in a magazine where they said, welcome to breathtaking Tokyo Water Park, where you can wash away the pressure and stress of the overcrowded city. <laughs> However, uh, let's say I have no idea how much energy they use, but the energy consumption per person is certainly negligible. And I think this is the importance we have to recognize in this, in this picture. It's, it's also about environmental quality. It's about people using the space. It doesn't matter if we do a super efficient building or even it's a zero energy building and nobody's using it because it's just bad. It's a waste of resources. So, it becomes very clear that we can't disconnect environmental and sustainable issues from, from architectural quality. Architectural quality and environmental quality is probably the most important piece of sustainability. That's why all the rating systems, whether it's LEED or whether it's uh, the German or BREEAM, uh, are never holistic. They never be holistic and I think we have to be aware of that as designers. So what we think we can contribute is something we call climate engineering. And I heard John said yesterday to his students, Transolar, these are the best climate engineers in the world. And I thought it's kind of quite funny. We basically invented this profession. And if you are basically the only one, it's easy to be the best. <laughs> but we looked at a little bit back in architectural history and found this spa built in Rome, 109 after Domini. And it's quite weird how it's orientated and then people studied it and found that this orientation provides the maximum shelter against cold winds while maximizing solar exposure for the people using the spa in Rome, like 109 after Domini. And like this is climate engineering, uh, certainly done without any kind of modeling at that time. Now, what we got asked two years ago whether we want to do an installation at the Architecture Biennale in Venice. So we were super proud being basically the first engineers ever who did an installation in Venice at the Architecture Biennale. But we thought, what, what can we do? Because usually we deal with warm air or humid air, like nothing you can really see. And so a couple of years ago, we had an installation in, at a fair in Frankfurt where we did a cloud. So we said, let's do a cloud again. Because a cloud is basically the only way, at least the only way we can think of right now, where we can visualize climate engineering. And it's really engineered, this cloud. This is, shows the principle. But for a cloud, sorry, you sometimes find uh, degree Celsius, but I'm going to translate it for you. Uh, for a cloud, you need to have saturated air. So then you can spray in water and it doesn't evaporate. And you don't see humidity, you see water particles in air and they should not evaporate. 
So you need to have this saturated layer and in order to make this floating above a clear layer, which is uh, at the bottom, which should be more or less comfortable, this has to be colder. So then warm air goes up, humid air goes up. So this is floating on top of the bottom layer. But as soon as the humid layer is touching the ceiling, we get condensation and the cloud is gone. So we need to have an, a dry, even a warmer layer with a lower density on top to keep the cloud in the middle. So that was the idea. And like <clears throat> after months of testing, we finally got it to the point where it started to, to float. So this was the installation. Tetsuo Kondo, an architect from Japan, he designed the space. He designed the ramp so people could walk through the cloud over this ramp and basically experience the different climate zones. So this is from below, and this is an image from above. It's, you can barely see it, but here it's the top of the cloud layer. And like <clears throat> August in Venice can become really uncomfortable, almost unbearable. But when people got down from 100 degrees, 100% 100 relative humidity, they felt actually pretty comfortable at 90 all of a sudden. So they recognized what adaptive comfort means. So this is what we do, and unfortunately, like, this is something we see basically all over the world. I love to show this in the US, <laughs> but it's not an American uh, thing, it's a universal thing. And it's a little bit related to systems like LEED. People walk down a checklist and apply gadgets to buildings. <coughs> and don't think about the thing which is stupid to begin with. And this is what we see a lot, and again, it's not a, an American thing, but what we have to do, and like Greg showed this yesterday pretty, in a pretty amazing project, we have to think about how we can become much more efficient by changing, adapting, or influencing, informing the design. I think that's what it is. We have to inform the design, which might lead to different type of aesthetic, even though we always say, like, we don't do style, like, we could work on all kind of, we could do a very efficient postmodern building or a very efficient neo Georgian building. Like, however, it's more fun to do more contemporary, to work on more contem contemporary design. But talking a little bit about the various styles, like, this is the flat iron building, and I love to show this image because what you see is, Every single window has external shading on the flat iron building. Every single window is operable for natural ventilation. This thing was built in 1902. And the reason why it is the way it is was because Carrier invented air conditioning in the 20s. This, this building at the time was very efficient and designers knew how to make the best out of the situation. I don't want to say it was super comfortable when they had 100 degrees and super humid in, in Manhattan in summer. But it was probably 10 months out of 12, it was very comfortable in this building. And also floor depth, you see here, was limited so that people had access to light and air. This, uh, this was the only source to have light and air, getting light and air was being at the facade. Now, since we have air conditioning, we all of a sudden see New York looks like this. And like if you, I don't want to judge the aesthetics, not at all, but if you look, for instance, at this building, there's so much coating on the glass to deal with it that they don't even get daylight. There is no window operable. So in case of power failure, people have to leave this building. They do not survive. Whereas people can still stay in the flat iron building. And you think, this is kind of wrong. What happened? And, and instead of going back, I think our intent is to, to get the understanding of the influence, the interaction between inside and outside back into architectural design. And work on this, we always say we try to work on this interface between engineering and design. We are not designers, we, are, we, are, we want to provide designers the, uh, the, the information to inform their design. So we ended up over the past 20 years almost uh, with buildings like this, which I'm going to show in a bit, which is a, like, we call, like to call it a breezing wall. Or then Benish did this building in Hamburg for Unilever, where they also have this kind of protected space, this kind of buffer zone, where the first time we used a single layer ETFE membrane to create this buffer zone. And it's pretty interesting because all of a sudden we also think about 
how much embodied energy is in the building. Like building a glass facade has a lot, requires a lot of energy. So instead of doing a glass facade, we all of a sudden try to use ETFE, a much lighter material, and also contributed to a different type of aesthetics. So what we see is the design is key, like design matters. And this was what, what Greg mentioned and showed very, in very impressive examples yesterday. Design is really the key to the good or to the bad, we have to say. And I think we should use it to the good. And what we do is we use all kinds of modeling to inform this. Now, Greg went back into the history. I grabbed this images, which showed one of the first CFD modelings we did in the 90s, and working with Danish on this building in Lübeck, where we have this solar chimney that draws air through this glass entrance hall. And we did the CFD modeling to convince the client that getting air from a ground duct is actually cooling the space. I think we were super proud of these modeling results and again was like first CFD modeling. One of the first CFD modelings we did. A little later we found out that this is all nonsense. Like <laughs> air doesn't shoot up like this. What we get is a cold layer on the bottom and then as it warms up it goes up. So it actually performs much better but the image was good enough to convince the client at the time. But the systems, the computer software as well as probably skills, has advanced. So this is how it looks today. And we can read much more out of these and even having like ISO lines where we show where at certain design conditions we do get uncomfortable situations on a glass facade. So it became pretty sophisticated. I don't want to go too deep into the numbers. But these tools are very useful to work and use in design. So I want to show you the building we did with KP, or where we worked with KPMB architects from Toronto. The building is the Manitoba Hydro headquarter in, in Winnipeg, in downtown Winnipeg. And when we studied the weather, the climate conditions in Winnipeg, we were actually a little scared because it's freezing cold there. Like it, they have like almost half the year they have temperatures below freezing. And it goes down to minus 35 degrees C, which is about the same in Fahrenheit at this point, and somebody throwing boiling water into the air, it's freezing instantaneously. So just to give you a little bit of an impression what this means. And when I got there, I got out of, for the interview, it was in January, I got out of the airport and I thought I got hit by a blast and jumped in a cab and I said to the cab driver, oh, this is cold here. And he said, you think it's cold? We just got a heat wave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, there you have a pretty good understanding. Like talking to cab drivers, you always get a good understanding of the place. But everybody said whenever it's cold, it's always sunny. So we looked, we studied on hourly weather data, how much sun do they really have? And we figured out there is no cold city in the world which has so much solar radiation, in particular in wintertime, than, many, than Winnipeg. It's Winnipeg and Saskatoon, like the two cities. And they have more solar radiation than the city of Milan in Italy. Like, think about this. So we said, if there is a place to do passive solar design, it's certainly Winnipeg. It's not New Mexico where people did it before. And like, the client really forced us to study. They didn't have a design competition, but they forced the design team to work on various different designs. So we studied low-rise, low-rise atrium buildings, but it became clear uh, that in order to get, get daylight to every workplace, it has to be a high-rise structure, given the amount of square footage they wanted to put on this, on this property. So in depth, we started to look at these three different type of high-rise structures in terms of program, in terms of energy, in terms of urban aspects, architecture form. Like when I say we, I mean the design team. But let's say in an interactive process, we always had to model. And we did energy modeling, but we also did wind modeling and shading studies for all these different type of uh, forms. We ended up with this uh, principle, like this is the cross section through the high rise building uh, where we have these six-story atrias facing due south and then this floor plate attached to it and a chimney or shaft at the end 
And the principle is very simple. I, you know, I have to go through some physics. I don't, I don't bother you too much with this stuff, but since we are engineers, I think it's important <laughs> to talk about this as well. But air comes in through these six-story atrias, and we, dis we have designed temperature in winter of 50 degrees in the atria, and as soon as the sun comes out, it further heats up. And then the air travels, is pushed through a raised floor into the office environment. We run pipes through the ceiling, so the ceiling, the superstructure itself, provides radiant heating and cooling to the space. And then the air goes through the shaft down into the basement, where we do have a heat recovery unit. So we transfer the heat from the exhaust on water pipes and bring it back to the supply air units, which are here in this atrium. So that's the principle. And then in summer, we open the south atrium. It becomes an outdoor, like an outdoor terrace. We r run the air again through raised floor. And there are units which condition the air. And then we have pipes. We run cold water through the pipes which are in the ceiling. We run water through at about 65 degrees. So it's not really chilled water. It's basically tempered. And then we exhaust naturally by the solar chimney. And then on top of it, we have about 300 boreholes under the building. Each of, each of this is 400 feet deep to create a geothermal heat exchange. And this provides about 100% of the cooling and 50% of the heating required for this building. Like this is how it looks like. This is the, on the bottom in the podium, there is this two-story south-facing winter garden on top, these are the six-story south-facing winter gardens. And we, have, we do have a water feature in this winter garden. We run uh, water down nylon strips, and we heat the water if we need to have humidification. So, and then there is a ceiling fan, which is mixing the humidity into the air. But this is, basically, this is basically the supply air unit. This is the mechanical room of the building. And the supply air units are under this bench. <coughs> integrated into this bench. And by doing this, we could avoid having an additional mechanical floor in the building itself. So we created so much real estate that it became actually economical to do this. And then behind these panels are the units that push the air into the raised floor plenum. So that's, that's about it, basically. And you think it it's pretty simple, like this is the north atrium where the solar chimney is connected. You see here the grills where we exhaust the air naturally in winter and mechanically in, uh, naturally in summer, mechanically in winter. And you look at what does it do in terms of energy, like this is the number for all Canadian commercial buildings, the average number. This is the, for the average number for new Canadian buildings. This is the latest code requirement, MNECB. And there was an incentive program when we designed the building. If you got in 25% under uh, MNECB, you got some incentives of the government. And this was the modeling result of, uh, of the modeling we did. And we, we monitored the building now for two years. And like the last year, we came in lower than this. We came in at 85 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. And the number is still going down. So, I think what I want to say is there is a huge potential in, let's say, having this kind of integrated design or informed design, but also buildings like this are not conceivable without the modeling. Like nobody, no client would go this path if you can't prove it's going to work. And, let's say, and therefore you also need to have this really sophisticated type of modeling. And Sometimes when, you, when we know certain uh, designers work with simplified tools, you can read this in their design. You can basically read in their design what kind of design tool they use. Now, uh, this is like outdoor wind modeling we did, and you see like when wind hits a building, there, it goes in all directions around the building, and there is one component which is going down, which is creating a very unpleasant environment. We call this downdraft, and like, Many American cities do have serious issues with downdraft, like New York and Toronto. And so the simple solution was to put in a, a, a canopy that redirects the, the downdraft before it hits the ground. And it redirects it straight to the neighbor. <laughs> but, but since he has no operable windows, he doesn't make, <laughs> doesn't matter. 
So it was a pretty, so it's not rocket science again, but it's important to consider it in the design. And here you see like this uh, plaza in front of the building. Here you see the canopy. It's about 20 feet deep. That was the result of our modeling. So whenever you think about wind, something like two or three feet, wind doesn't matter. Like wind don't, doesn't care about things that are small. Everything has to be big. So we ended up with this 20 feet and it actually works pretty well. Like this is the solar chimney. Became a little bit the icon. It's a little taller than it would need to be, but the architects like the, the proportions. Now, showing another building where we worked with Sauerbruch Hutton from Berlin, and we worked on this at the same time, but it's a completely different climate. It's Frankfurt. Frankfurt is basically always, compared to Winnipeg, it's always intermediate season. It's always shorter season. Like, like sometimes we say Frankfurt has two weather conditions. Either it's raining cold or it's raining warm. <laughs> but it's a little true. And they have sh really short periods where it's hot or cold. So we, we, we ask the question, well, how, what's an optimized design for a climate like this? And uh, we ended up with a building, or like Sauerbruch Hutton already provided the shape of the building in a competition. But this is the shape of the high rise, and we figured out that it's right, let's say, within this prevailing wind directions. It's like an aircraft wing in the prevailing wind directions. And we said, how could we use this to optimize the performance of the building? And we ended up with a double facade designed as a ring. And when wind comes from here, like the facade, you see here the Oprah windows of the outer facade. They open like gills in order to catch the wind and we keep the backside rather closed so that we basically, the wind blows up this ring and create a slight overpressure. It's not big overpressure, it doesn't cause any draft and it's mainly an intermediate season. But we get a slight overpressure that is enhancing the natural ventilation of the building. So that's about it. So this is the southeast facade. This is the southwest facade. And you see all the operable windows that are capable to catch the wind. Now, I saw this in St. Louis. I thought, I have to make the picture. I hope there's nobody here who was involved in it. <laughs> but this is another possibility to use wind. But I tell you, if you use it for natural ventilation, it's so much more efficient. This basically doesn't do anything and I tell you we used wind turbines before and I know what I'm talking about this doesn't do much <laughs> but then like these are all these corporate headquarters I like to show this one as well it was a really required to be a low budget building in Damascus where we worked with Atelier Lyon out of Paris the French school and the parents they had to pay the, the building, like the French government, they paid the design and they paid the, for the land, but the building, the construction was paid by the parents. And the parents, these are all Europeans who put their kids there. They came to us, to the design team and said, you know, Europeans are not used to air conditioning systems. So they said, these air conditioning systems, they make our kids sick. Could we do a building in Damascus without air conditioning? And we thought, oh, this is a great task, let's try. So we ended up with a scheme where we do have these solar chimneys again. They are facing west to get the low sun angles in the afternoon. The back wall is a masonry wall that is heated up by the sun and it stays hot at night in order to draw the cold air from the courtyard at night through pipes that are in the slab and then through the building and in order to cool down the building at nighttime. I think that's the main intent. And then we do have these simple shading devices between the buildings, some vegetation, and we have actually measured an almost 10 degree temperature drop from here to the courtyards by these simple measures. So again, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. And we achieve, we model that we can achieve at 100 degrees over a couple of weeks every day we can keep the space inside at something like 85 degrees. So you would say 85, oh, that's pretty hot. It is warm, but they were happy. They said like, when we have 100 degrees outside, 85 inside is pretty fine. And they, the, the mechanical engineer from the Lebanon, he said to us, I, I don't care about what you guys are doing. As soon as you are gone, I put in split units. 
but there are no split units in the building yet and they want to extend which they probably put a, a, on a delay given the situation in Syria uh, but the extension also have the same is using the same principles than this one so this is a nighttime image so but then for over the past couple of years, we more and more also talked about how can we use these principles in the outdoor environment, thinking about the outdoor environment. And there was one image a guy from Transola took in Kuala Lumpur, which I find pretty intriguing. It's a cafe, and it's, you can barely see it. But there are all people sitting here under the canopy, and they have these fans where they spray in some water. And you think, why do they do this in Kuala Lumpur, where it's already so humid? But what they achieve is a little temperature drop and a little bit of air movement and in combination with the shade, it makes people happy and they're all sitting outside. And they have inside a super cool cafe, like 68 degrees probably. There was nobody inside, zero. People appreciated 90 degrees in the shade with a little bit of air movement. And the same thing in Damascus. This is a souk in Damascus. People go shopping outside. Nobody want to have a shopping mall. This is how they want to go shopping at 100 degrees outside. So you, we recognize that people in the outdoor environment all of a sudden accept a much wider temperature range. And the question is certainly how can we use this and how can we uh, strategically manipulate outdoor climate? And as engineers, we want to calculate it because if we can't calculate it, it's kind of not true. It's just... Uh... So... There is this way of calculating outdoor uh, environmental condition, and it's called perceived temperature. So we can calculate a, the perceived temperature, and it takes into account the outdoor temperature, but then also humidity, air movement, radiation. And when we re talk about radiation, we distinguish between short wave radiation coming from the sun and the long wave radiation that comes from surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. So this all is mixed together to this perceived temperature and working in a hot climate, the goal is to minimize times when we have great heat stress or ex extreme heat stress. So we want to get it into at least moderate heat stress most of the time. So now since we have the tool, we started to look at a place in, in Doha, in Qatar, and having, like, did a very simple comparison, like having a person exposed to the sun he has 100% of the year, he has extreme heat stress. If we put in a shade, we reduce it by about a third. If we have the shade and air movement, we reduce it again down to something like 40% of the time when we have extreme heat stress. And then what we also did is said, okay, maybe at this plaza we could have some radiant uh, cooling in the floor. Like here, in, in, you do a lot of, in, in cold areas, you do the, a lot of snow melting system. So it's basically a snow melting system for, ex, for cooling in extreme periods. And then when we do this, at this time we want to block the wind because then the wind becomes counterproductive because we are already cooler than the outdoor environment. So you see, like we got it down to something like 10%, and we said, if it's like very important to be comfortable all the time, this 10% of the time, we could also have some cooler air, and it could be actually an exhaust of a building. Uh, we introduce into the public, into the outdoor realm, and then all of a sudden we have 100% of the time, no extreme heat stress in a place like Doha. Like this was important because uh, this study basically went into the application for uh, the Soccer World Cup going to Qatar to prove that it's potentially possible. I st we can still discuss whether it makes sense, <laughs> but to see if it's potentially possible to have the World Cup there and, and players, uh, soccer players, uh, are going to survive <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but we also used it in the competition for this building where we worked with lava architects from Germany and Australia for Mustar, for the Mustar Plaza in Mustar City. And we came up with this kind of shading structure for the plaza. And like there is, it has some very high tech surfaces. There is photovoltaic supposed to be on the top and a low reflective coating on the bottom. And here, this is a rendering from below during the day. But the intent is to create a gradient from hot to the super air conditioned environment so that it's not like a shocking transition. 
And so we did all this modeling, but the important thing was that we provide the shade, we do have a little bit of cooling in the floor, we do have this low E that reflects the long wave cooling from the ground. And then, what also important, at nighttime it has to go, because at nighttime you get this radiation to the space, it's like the space starts to become your cooling source. And if you keep it shaded during the night, it starts to become, again, counterproductive. So that's why it's important to have these umbrellas being able to fold. And like this is how they look like then at nighttime. So here, a rendering. So you see, like this is useful of like extending this uh, thinking about thermal comfort and well-being for people into the outdoor environment. Um, but we can also do this in a bigger scale. This is an image done by Fosters in Dubai. And what we do in our built environment is actually the opposite. Like you look at this street realm and you know, without doing any calculation, you know that this is not the right thing to do. Not in Dubai. And the Fosters did this infrared picture. And what you see is like at an outdoor temperature of basically 100 degrees, the radiant temperature from the surrounding surfaces are at 130, 130 degrees. And you recognize this when you're in summer in Phoenix and you walk over a street, how the asphalt radiates into your face. And this is what happens here. And it makes this place, and then being exposed to the sun in addition, the perceived temperature is somewhere at 150 degrees probably. You don't need to go to a sauna. And this is Paris, same issue. And like what happened in 2003, we got this extreme heat wave in Europe where we had like hot conditions between 85 and 100 degrees over th basically three months, which is never been, never seen before in Central Europe. And like none of these buildings in Paris do have air conditioning for a good reason. Like usually it cools down at nighttime and when people open their window, they get this nighttime cooling and that keeps the space comfortable enough. Now, what happened is that Paris heated up to, to the extent that downtown Paris stayed about at 90 degrees in this period. So then the buildings, because they couldn't cool down, got hotter and hotter every day to the extent where uh, elderly people got health issues. And like it was, the statistics say that 40,000 people in Europe died uh, in this heat wave and a, quite a, a lot of them in Paris. So we did this competition for Grand Paris where we had Météo de France on our team. And Météo de France showed us these measurements they did. And here you see the average summer temperature in Paris over the past 100 years. And it always had been within this band. And then all of a sudden there was summer 2003 up here. And like this is the predicted temperature rise over the next 100 years. And what we see in the summer 2100, the summer 2003 will become the coldest summer. In 2050, it will be an average summer. So all of a sudden, Paris has climate conditions like Sevilla, summer conditions. But it's not designed like Sevilla, like the street, the pattern of the city is actually different. Sevilla do not have these kind of streets where you can see how it heats up. So the question is, how could we adjust the temperature? And with Meteor de France, we did this modeling. This was actually done by Meteor de France, where they did this temperature modeling for the entire Grand Paris, like Greater Paris area. And you see the current situation after a heat wave and how it stays green, which is basically 90 degrees at nighttime, the entire Greater Paris area. And just by changing the reflectivity of asphalt surfaces, by putting uh, let's say millions of trees into Paris by having green roofs or reflective roofs, we reduce the temperature by about 10 degrees. And here you see the nighttime temperature. And we could basically mitigate the, t the predicted temperature increase by global warming over the next 50, 100 years. So that's the potential. And this is why I always say uh, global warming is not, people in Germany tend to call it a climatic catastrophe. It's not a catastrophe. A catastrophe is something that happens all of a sudden. We know that what's going to happen, so we can prepare. We just need to, to do it. So finally, I want to show you 
what it means uh, these, using these tools. I want to show you a competition we did in Helsinki where we had been on, on some teams, <laughs> on multiple teams. <laughs> but this was the big team, like big out of Copenhagen. And there is an organization called Citra that want to do a building in, in here. And they want to turn this into a housing area. And there is a master plan in place that had been established, which looks like this. And like, uh, it has some general issues in this master plan. And Citra actually encouraged the teams to think about the master plan as well, which we did with Big. So Big did these nice sketches where they said, okay, this is the plot of Citra, and potentially they could do, put in this, creating a serious issue for the neighbors having no access to sun and light. And this is the most important thing in Helsinki, like in an area which is dark and cold, you want to have access to sun and access to light. So we, we said, okay, let's cut the building depending on orientation. We put in, we defined some angles which are reasonable for the various type of orientations. And then Big started to apply this to all buildings in the master plan and started to shape them. So we said, okay, we don't go there and say, your master plan is stupid. We just massage it a little bit. And we did the daylight modeling, which showed that we get two to three times more daylight and sun hours in the public realm by doing this. And then this was the master plan. And we said, we can't cut out so much massing. We have to kind of shift it. So in areas where we have bigger distances, we got in more massing, and in areas which are dense, we had less massing. And obviously I heard from somebody in the jury, the city planning said, when, when we even discuss this, we are out here. Like, this was the moment when we lost the competition. <laughs> but the point was that we said, you know, big used one of the buildings and to show that we are not doing building design. The city is not supposed to look like this. But instead of having a two-dimensional plot where you say you can extrude up to this height, we said, why don't you give people a three-dimensional shell and then architects come, can come and within the shell develop all kinds of buildings. It's just you give it, uh, put it into some boundaries three-dimensionally. So that was the intent was obviously not convincing enough. But I want to show you this final project we worked on with Herzog Demeron which is the Adstelium building. And we got uh, uh, some harsh critique from some engineers in Germany working on this because obviously it doesn't look like a super energy efficient building. But just to, let's say, reiterate the potential of modeling. And I think it was not really well used in this case. But if we look at commercial buildings like this one, we know that uh, the heat losses by transmission like the heat loss, as you have by the facade, got down since we insulate our, our facades, our envelopes of buildings so well, it got down to something like 10% of the total energy consumption of a building. So what's the point of really minimizing envelope? It's not the driver for energy consumption anymore. It's far away. And the biggest losses we still have with the glass, and whether we have more or less, of surfaces like here doesn't really matter. At the same time, uh, we know that artificial lighting is the biggest, biggest energy consumer we have in commercial buildings. So potentially in a building like this, we could really think about how can we maximize massing while, having, while providing daylight to every single person in the building and you suddenly end up with something which is much more shaped, which might look like this Mikado. I think we did some daylight modeling to make sure that everybody has access to daylight, but it was not intensively used for developing the shape of this. But I think this is the potential when we start to combine parametric design and modeling, like performance-based modeling tools, when we th start to bring this together. And Grasshopper, we started to test Grasshopper for these kind of things. And it has an enormous potential, I would say. And to this regard, I think that we've seen so much uh, buildings informed digitally over the past 10, 20 years, 
But I think we barely scratched the surface. I think there is so much more potential if we really bring the various types of tools together. So that's, that's it from my side. Thank you very much.